Hello everybody. This is my 10th lecture on transistor design and applications. And today's main topic is the Miller effect on transistors in gain and frequency response. But before I get to that, I would like to say a few comments on the differential amplifier stage that you see in here. In my last lecture, I ran out of battery and I didn't complete that lecture properly. So let me just spend one minute talking about the gain and talking about that differential amplifier. Okay. The gain, the differential gain for such an amplifier would be equal to RC divided by little Re's. And RC in this case is nothing but a transistor. Okay, or the collector of a transistor. So the gain would be just the resistance looking inside the collector of that transistor Q4, which is very, very high, divided by the little Re's that we have for Q, Q1 and Q2. Okay, so this is the gain equation. And that gain will almost be equal to around 5,000 volts, 5,000 with no load, okay? So that means few millivolts in here will be enough to saturate the, the output stage. And, st and actually amplifiers like this is not usually used without a feedback. This is something that you see inside an integrated chips, okay? You won't see something like this, where you have an active current mirror as a load. And where you have just a few millivolts to saturate the output transistors. That won't happen, okay? Okay, let's move now to our main topic. Our main topic, like I said, is the mirror effect on gain and frequency response for a transistor. In a transistor, this is the kind of caps that we see in here. You have that cap in here, the gain killer, the so-called CCB, that cap between the collector and the base. And you have another cap in there called CBE, the cap between the base and the emitter. And you will always have a CL, you know, a straight capacitance or whatever associated associated with, with, with the load or with the output. You'll always have some kind of cap going to the load. Okay. Now, this is a killer cap for the gain and for the frequency. And why is that? Because the C effective, the effective value of this capacitor will be equal to that cap which is built in, by the way, these caps are not put in the, tra the transistors. I mean, they are there. They are there. They're inherently there. You can't get rid of that. Okay. So you will always have some kind of capacitance inside the transistors. And when do, you, when do you worry about these caps? It's when you operate at high frequency. You start looking at these things because they, they become very, very important. And like I said, this cap is the killer cap. Why? Because the effective value for that cap equally the value of that cap multiplied by the gain plus one. That's why it's a killer. So its value will increase according to the gain. And why it's a killer cap? Because look at that. I mean, you have 180 degrees out of phase between the input signal and the output signal. And that input signal is amplified by the gain, so probably it's 100 or 50 times whatever the input signal is, okay? And that cap will couple that signal from the input, from the output to the input. I mean, you're having a positive input in here, an extremely negative input in there, okay? So that means this cap will act like a negative feedback. It will be start pulling down the input, the input. Okay, look at this. I mean, positive input in here and a negative input in here, and that will start pulling it down. What does that mean? That means the input impedance 
for that stage is going very low because you're gonna need more current and more voltage, okay, to rise that, that, that base signal again. And the opposite happens, of course. You have a negative few millivolts in here or a negative voltage at the input of the base. That means you're gonna have a positive voltage at the collector. This is negative and that's positive. And therefore this cab will start pulling that, 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 that base voltage up, okay? That's why it's a killer cab for the game. So as we see in here, and as the frequency increases, okay, your gain will be reduced. So your gain will start vary according to the frequency. As the frequency increases, your gain will be going down. That's the so-called the Miller effect. And the disaster of it is just because the gain is multiplied by the value of that cap. And we explained why, why that happens. You have another cap in here, which is between the base and the emitter. Okay, and that cap decreases the gain as the frequency goes up. Same thing as that one, but it's not that, it's not that killer like that one up there, okay? Same thing, because it's connected between the base and the ground. And the higher the frequency you have, of course, the more you are shorting the base to the ground. So that's, that's, that's uh, what, what the cap between the base and the emitter does. And you have that CL in there, that cap at the, at the, at the load, okay? That decreases the slew rate of the voltage, dVO over dT. So that means the slope or dV by dT will be much affected by the value of that CL. So it decreases the slow rate. And as the frequency increases, of course, start limiting maybe the amplitude of the output. So now we are talking about the caps that we have around the transistor it's operating at high frequency. Now what kind of solution we have especially for that, that Miller effect, or for that killer cap that we have between the collector and the base. And this is the solutions that we have for it. Going back exactly to the same differential amplifier, we find a use for it. But before we go on to that, let me just talk a little bit more about the merits of this differential stage in here. Like we said, the merits of that stage in here is that you're gonna have very high gain, very high gain, and at the same time, your inputs, when properly selected with the circuit, associated circuit, it can swing all the way up and all the way down. And we add another merit to that now, an additional benefit for it, is the one that we're gonna get rid of that Miller effect in there. What do we do? Like we've done before in the current mirrors, if you still remember, we let one of the transistors, let's say the, the matched transistors, we let one of these transistors deal with the current and we let another current deal with the, with the, with the, with the output. And this is almost the same idea. We separate the tasks. We let one transistor deal with the signal, okay? And we let another transistor deal with the load. And this is the idea that we have in here. And look at these, I mean, those are grounded. This is very important, okay? Now what happens in a case like this? Our input signal in here is fit into Q1 and the collector in here is fixed, connected to VCC, so there is no swing. There is no swing that we have seen up there. So that means the value of this cap will stay as it is. It won't be multiplied by the gain. So you have your cap in here, the same value without being multiplied because the collector is not moving, it's not going anywhere. While at the same time, you're amplifying that signal through Q1 and Q2. And if you still remember the gain, like we said before, it's nothing but RL divided by little r e in here and a little r e in here. Okay, that's the differential gain in a case like this. 
So we we'll let this handle the input signal, and we we'll let this transistor handle the output. In a case like this, we got rid of the Miller effect. Okay, another solution too. And by the way, when you look at this, I mean, this is this is a common base, a common base amplifier. When you look at this transistor by itself, it's a common base amplifier. We look at the both of them, they are a differential amplifier. Why it's a common base amplifier? Because the base is grounded, okay? And the signal is fed through the emitter and the output from the collector. So this transistor, Q2, operates like a common base, a common base amplifier. That's the idea. And the same thing, as a matter of fact, happens in here too. We're gonna see that. Now, to get rid of the Miller effect also, we have the cascode configuration where we don't have any Miller effect anymore. What do we do about that? It's the same idea, to separate the tasks. One transistor will deal with the signal and one transistor will deal with the load. We got our transistor in here fixed at plus three volts. And this is, by the way, acts like a common base emitter, a common base amplifier. And it deals with the load resistor. And we have a Q1 in here, which deals with the input signal. I look at that no Miller effect, why? Because the collector is fixed. How it's fixed, you have your three volts in here. Minus 0.6, you got 2.4 volts in here. 2.4 volts is fixed, and we have about 0.6 down there. So whatever signal is being amplified, your collector is not moving. So therefore, there is no multiplication. The gain is not multiplied by the value of that cap to kill that input signal and destroy the, the what they call it, the, the, input, the input impedance, and at the same time to affect the performance of this transistor as frequency increases. Okay, so just separate the tasks. One transistor deals with the signal, the other one deals with the load. That's the solution for the Miller effect. Okay. And that brings us to something very interesting in here. I don't know, probably it's the right time even to talk about it. This is a very, very basic voltage regulator. Okay, I believe I've done that. I built this circuit and I, mean, I used it in my first amplifier that about maybe more than four years ago. Let me see. Yes. That was 79. So we're talking about 21. Oh, 44 years ago. 44 years ago, I built this voltage regulator for my first 50 watts amplifier that I built at that time. Okay. And that was the voltage regulator for the pre-amplifier. So I didn't understand how it works, even though it looks very simple, but actually I didn't understand how it works. Because looking at this transistor exactly, this one in here, if you look at it as a current device, you'll never understand how this circuit works. If you look at it as a transconductance device where you apply a voltage to get a current through the collector, that, 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 that will let you understand what's, what's happening in a case like this. What do we have in here? We have a reference voltage. First of all, this is a 10 volts regulated output. It's from 0 to, to 100 milliamps. And of course, you can increase it to 1 amp or whatever you want. Once you understand how it works, you just change a few components and that's all. I mean, the 3055 easily can go to 3 amps. Okay. So you can design it to, to give you 1 amp. What do we have in here? We have the reference, which is this VBE and this Zener. That's called the reference voltage. We have the feedback network, which is R2 and R3. Each one is 1K, 1K, okay? We have the pass transistor, the one which is responsible for supplying the current, which is the 2 and 3055, that's Q1. We have R1, which is another 1K, okay? To supply the current for that, that, that pass transistor. And our unregulated voltage, which is between 12 and 25, and regardless to what it is, you can always rearrange your resistors to get what you want out of it, okay? And it 
So short circulated because it has a feedback mechanism that based on the reference voltage of VBE and VZ. And how do you go by designing something like that? You have to make sure that your resistor is enough to supply base current multiplied by, by beta or HFE for that transistor to supply whatever current you want in here at the minimum voltage. That's how you select your R1. At the minimum voltage you are dealing with, getting your maximum current and having your minimum HFE or beta for, for here and choosing your R1 to do just that. How the feedback mechanism works, it works as following. Whatever output you got in here, it will be divided by two because this resistor equals that resistor. And in your case, you might change whatever resistors you want to suit your needs, okay? And that voltage in here is supplied to the base of that transistor, the 2N2901, the very, very basic, the very, very cheap transistor and the very, the very used transistor, okay? It's very much used. Very small, by the way. Anyway, so that feedback is fit into the base of that transistors. Now, what happens in a case like this? And you have your zener in here. When you have your zeners around the four volts to five volts, their stability with temperature is is extremely high. At that at that range, you have almost a zero temperature coefficient for that zeners. That's why when you go up, you have to watch your temperature coefficient, or when you go in down. So we have a good temperature, we have a good selection for the 4.3 and we have another around let's say 0.7 in there. So you got your five volts as a reference voltage. Now, how does the circuit work? Suppose you increased in here by a few, mill few millivolts, 10 millivolts, 15 millivolts, whatever. Okay, that will be divided by, by half. Half of it will appear in here. Okay, and that will push the VBE with whatever difference you got, and like I said before, looking at this transistor as a current device, you'll never understand the circuit. But look at it as a transconductance device, where an 18 millivolts applied between the base and the emitter will double that current. That is exactly what's happening. Now you know what the story is. And in case if you don't know, just go to the few, 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 few lectures before to know what I'm talking about. And I, like we said before, looking at this transistor as a transconductance device where VBE will be equals KT of Q multiplied by natural logarithm of IC over IS. That's the equation for it. And you'll find out that 18 millivolts or 17 millivolts applied to the base of this transistor will double that current. And you didn't need actually to double it. Just, just a little bit of it will be enough to drive that transistor crazy. So in case you have a higher voltage in here, it will appear in here. That current will go crazy across IC and it will go across R1. And that means VE will be going down, okay, to stabilize at the 10 volts. So this is the feedback mechanism and how it works. And you got everything down there, okay. And the equation for it, which is a standard equation for all voltage regulators when, when you have an adjustable voltage for it. VO equals parenthesis VZ plus VBE, that's our five volts, one plus R2 over R3, which equals finally to 10 volts. Because whenever you have your feedback across those two resistors and one of them, and the current, we consider the current to be the same because it's a stiff network. IB will not affect it, okay? So you get your equation because they are passing the same current while R3 having the five volts, okay? And do all your math. That's the equation, which is a standard equation, by the way. So this is very interesting just to see an application of what I mean when looking at the transistor as a transconductance device instead of a current device. More stuff in here. This is HFEs for the various transistors that you got in here. Where well, HFE varies with a changing IC. And look at that. Look at these transistors and how they behave. This is a logarithmic. This is a logarithmic value for beta or HFE. Okay. That you see in here. And this is a logarithmic scale also for the collector or IC current. And almost, they are almost behave the same way. Okay. 
where you start having your HF increasing as IC increases and then it stops or let's say settles okay and after that start decreasing with an increasing IC so this is the behavior of most HFE that's why when you want to deal with let's say accurate circuits differential amplifiers logarithmic amplifiers whatever you cannot deal with it as a current device and and base your calculations on HFE and beta that won't work that work for a simplified uh, say simplified circuits okay but for accurate circuits that absolutely won't work okay that's the LM394 that's a matched pair I mean it's almost have a steady state line this is well selected well selected device I believe this is uh, two transistors matched in one package I don't know two or four I don't remember anymore okay but this is the graph just to give you an idea how HFE acts with a changing collector current so let me see what we have let me see what else we have oh yeah more interesting stuff more interesting stuff you see you start looking at weird things I mean look at that I mean a lot of beautiful things this is just an application this is an applied this is an applied example let me see what's written in here it's a temperature controller for 50 watts heater okay so it's, that's what do we have in here look at those beautiful things look at that current mirror active load look at those Darlington's from both sides look at this beautiful current source that you got down there I and mean, this is truly nice current limiter up there I mean a lot a lot of beautiful things that you have in here okay and I don't think we have time to discuss all of these goodies right now but we're gonna leave that to our next lecture so I believe we have to stop at this point and we're gonna start talking about applications in our next lecture and for those of you who are not subscribed please subscribe little encouragement is appreciated and if you don't understand any of the stuff I'm talking about just go back to the earlier lectures they were discussed in a very very deep details okay this is a good stuff and we're gonna see a lot of it in my next lecture I have to stop at this point thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you next time have a nice day